what is the temperature where you're located? I have to look mine up. I have no idea, but I can tell you it's warmer than it's supposed to be, which makes me happy. So what is the temperature? And you got to tell us Fahrenheit or Celsius so we're not all too confused. Um, what is the temperature where you are? Awana, you're somewhere warm. I'm going to have to go in Fahrenheit. Um, it's 85 here. 85, very nice. And where is that? Chicago. Oh, Chicago, me too. I'm mine's 83. I'm a little cooler maybe out in the suburbs. <laughs> Anyone else want to tell us what the temperature is? Feel free to just unmute yourself or type it in. I feel like we're all pretty warm. Global warming is a thing, I guess. It's 48 degrees here in Danville, California. 48. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Oh, so it's a little yeah. cooler there, huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. And then let's go ahead and find out what nano degree you're all in. That would be, I that, always like to know that because sometimes that does help me guide the conversation a little as we go. So if you want to type in which nano degree you are taking, 59 in Cupertino. Uh, it's cool out there. Uh, you can talk to me about cool in February in Chicago. Uh, not fun. Which nano degree are you in? Self-driving cars, digital marketing, digital marketing. All right. Who else? Predictive analytics. Who else wants to let us know? Self-driving cars. Very good. All right. I'm going to share the presentation here in just a second. As you all are letting us know your nano degree. If everyone can, just for the sake of background noise, keep yourself muted and use the chat box anytime you have a question. If I don't get it to it immediately, uh, my colleague Rachel is also on from Udacity. She can help us answer some quick questions if I don't see it, or I will get to it as I am talking. But if you could just make sure you're muted and That way we don't have background noise. But if you can't type and you need to ask a quick question, totally fine to unmute yourself and speak up. So we will go ahead and get started. Uh, we are going to talk today about skills, gaps, and weaknesses. Uh, I know all of us have had an interview when you get faced with that dreaded question, what is your greatest weakness? And it's never a fun one to talk about. And in fact, I think... Um, I used to have the philosophy that I thought it was a terrible interview question, and I think it's a terrible one that you have to answer, but I actually think it's got a lot of validity as to why they ask it. So we're going to talk about why they ask it, um, but more importantly, we're going to talk about strategies on how to answer it. And those of you who haven't, uh, I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Angela. I'm one of the career coaches here at Udacity. Uh, I worked in finance for many years, had my own business, lived overseas and um, originally from America, but also lived in Australia, many years in China and in Singapore. I work now as a corporate trainer and career coach, and I specialize in obviously helping people with their careers and then also communication and presentation skills. Oh, it's 19 in South Africa. That sounds wonderful right now. Okay, we've got a few more coming in. Wonderful, thanks all of you for joining. We are just getting started. So what we're gonna talk about today, for about the first 40 minutes, we're gonna understand why interviews ask about our weaknesses and our skills gaps. Then we're gonna talk about really why we should have a growth mindset and why that helps us around this question. Then I'm gonna help you think about ways to identify the gap and weakness that you might want to talk about. And we want to identify maybe things that you could be doing, have done, or will do to overcome these issues. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how you'll develop that narrative to address the skills, gaps, and weaknesses. Then I'm going to try to save about 20 minutes towards the end for a Q&A session, and that can be on anything we discussed today or anything to do with careers and coaching that you might uh, want to ask about. I know it's been a little hard to get some appointments for coaching, but that's getting ready to change. We have new coaches coming on very, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. 
So what is your greatest weakness? And yes, we all dread the question. It's a question that you will probably get in every single interview. And it's sometimes asked in a few different ways so they can try to get to that answer. So here are some different ways you might hear this question, um, but kind of, and it's, it's nice to read through these so that you're, you know what they really wanna know is what is your weakness. So they might say, what is your biggest struggle at work? Or what do you wish you were better at? What are some of your weaknesses? What are your weakest skills? What do you consider to be one of your weaknesses? What would you consider your boss say is your weakest area? Or tell me about a time you failed. These are all different ways they might ask the question. And you know when they ask this, they're really getting at what is your weak point? What is the part that you wish you were better at? And I often like to think of it as what do I wish I was better at? Because I, when I coach a lot of people and they try to think about the right weakness, we all know we have a weakness. That's, that's not any big secret, right? But it's the one that you really are comfortable talking about that's professional, that you want to address in the interview setting that's really important. And I often like to think of it as what do I wish I was better at? Because that helps me really get to the root of what I think maybe my weakness is. And I'll just say one of my weaknesses right now is sometimes when I'm, I've kind of gotten to the very end of a project or a presentation, it's that the fine details at the end. If you noticed, I had a little typo in, in my slide that I just noticed when I uh, was reading it. Um, that is definitely my weakness. And it's funny, I started out as a financial analyst, so maybe that's why I wasn't doing that anymore. Um, I can have a lot of attention to detail for a while, and then I get to a point where I'm like, I'm done. Um, so for me, that is, I know, weakness. And, and what I do to overcome it, and we'll talk about that step next, is really I usually find someone I partner with who can help do a QA check for me. Just look at it, check the quality, make sure I don't have typos, make sure I know Rachel knows, make sure I don't have weird fonts happening, uh, because that's where I know I need that extra partner um, to work with. So why do they want to know my weakness? And you think about it's the iceberg, right? They see, of course, you're showing your best side in your interview. And like an iceberg, like we know we only see so much on above the surface, right? There's a lot under the surface that you want to get at. I'm sure maybe many of you have hired someone or you know someone that after you get to know them a little better or work with them, you suddenly go, ooh, now I'm finding out what's underneath the surface. Now I'm getting a little more depth. Um, and maybe that would have changed your hiring decision all the time. But when we know the type of person that we're working with and what that weakness might be, maybe we know what the other weaknesses on our team are and we need to make sure this person can help their weakness and where are they strongest and, and where might there be a gap. So those are all things that we can be thinking about, about why they want to know that weakness. So. First, they wanna know, are we self-aware enough to know our weaknesses? If someone says, I don't have a weakness or I don't know what to say, my first thought is they probably don't know themselves well enough. And it's really important, important to be self-aware in the workplace. And are you humble? Are you humble enough to say, hey, I kind of stink at this. Now, we're not gonna say, that, say it that way in the interview, but we all know there's something we're not great at and can we be humble? And do you look for areas to improve in yourself? Remember that, that phrase, what do I want to get better at? What do I want to do better? And that really helps you think about that growth mindset. I want to improve. I want to get better. And then think about what are you doing to overcome your weakness? And for a lot of you, it's taking that nano degree and taking a class. And maybe that's, maybe that was your weakness, a certain skill that you need, you knew you needed to get better at. And that last one, do you have a growth mindset? So let's look at that growth mindset. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that phrase, that um, something that we all are talking about now is embracing this growth mindset. Um, there's a lot of great books out about it. Uh, one of my favorites is actually by uh, Carol Dweck. It's called Mindset, if you're interested in learning more. But really that growth mindset is saying, I can, I can learn to do anything I want. I can do anything I want if I work hard and, and uh, put in the effort to do it. Now, there's some things I don't want to do. I don't want to get better. I don't have a desire to run a marathon. So 
yeah, maybe I can do it if I really wanted to, but that's not something I'm trying to do, but someone might be. Um, but, and, and it's also showing that failure or, ch or change is an opportunity to grow. So just like you hear all the time, people that run very successful companies had 12 startups that failed before they actually made it, right? So always remember that failure is an opportunity to grow. Have that growth mindset. Believe you can do anything you want. Um, understand that the roadblocks and the challenges that you might face is what's going to make you better. And using those examples in a in an interview where you can talk about, this is why I, I know I needed to get better at something. This project wasn't successful or as successful as I would have liked it to be because of X. So I'm working on getting better at that. And it's a lot about your effort and your attitude to de determining your abilities, not something you were born with. Um, and it's showing that you're inspired by the success of others, like working with people who are successful, learning from them, growing and pushing yourself. And really it's a lot about trying new things. So I think that a growth mindset and a positive attitude really go hand in hand. And when we have that growth mindset, we're saying, yes, there are things I can get better at. There are things I want to be better at. And when we have that attitude, we typically will then push ourselves a little further and maybe go into jobs and interviews that maybe we're not 100% qualified for yet. Well, maybe we're qualified. We might not tick off every box, but we're close enough that we know we can put in the effort to get there and be successful in that role. So what does a fixed mindset look like? Let's talk, let's look for a second at what we don't wanna be. We wanna avoid this where you feel like that failure, if you failed once that, that you're done, that you, that's where your limit is, that's where you have to stop. It's believing that you're either good at something or you're not. Uh, it's thinking that your abilities can't change. You can do it or you can't. It's often times people with a more of a negative attitude that don't like to be challenged. They give up easily. They cannot take feedback. They stick to only what they know. Um, and if any of you have had children or you remember your parents saying it to you, these are, you know, you always are teaching your kids a growth mindset. You can do what you want. You can put your mind to it. You can work hard. And, keeping that mindset that you want to instill in your children and making sure you have that in yourself. Or if you remember your parents saying it to you, this is why they want you to challenge yourself and push you even further. So that's where having that growth mindset really helps us take a positive spin on our careers, where we believe we can go. And in this interview process, it can help us look at this weakness question without fear or, or being a hesitant to talk about it. So how do you decide the weakness you want to discuss? This can be tricky. Um, obviously, first, it needs to be work related. It can't be, um, well, you know, I was never a very good singer. And that really has been a hard thing in my life. Like that can't be your weakness because that has nothing to do with the job. They want to know a weakness that is a weakness related to your profession and your job. Um, it needs to be authentic. It can't be an off the shelf uh, weakness that you've heard other people say. And I have had a lot of people try to use those kind of canned responses. People will see right through it. And it typically needs to be non-essential to the job you're applying for. So non-essential means, you know, if the job you're applying for needs you to have very strong proficiency in Python and you just started taking intro to programming, that's probably a pretty essential weakness. Um, I'd be surprised if you were even sitting in the interview at that point. Um, so making sure that you're not thinking about your weakness as a core responsibility in that job. Um, and it should be something that's minor and fixable, something that you can work on. Either you get better at or you have tools to be better at it. And we'll talk about some of those and, and ways that you can talk about it. And we'll have time at the end where if you kind of know your weakness, but you're not sure how to talk about it, we can bring that up. And, and obviously it needs something to show you can work on it. Maybe you're already working on it um, or you have an idea of how you can be better at it. I'm gonna pause for just a second. And if there are any questions at this stage, please feel free to type them in. If you need to unmute yourself, bring it up. We still have quite a bit to cover, but just make sure that 
everyone knows you can type in questions at any time. What not to say, and I love that little monkey. Um, never say I don't have a weakness. That like, remember that, that self-awareness, that humbleness, that's like, you've just lost it all right there. Um, or, or an old way of telling people how to talk about a weakness is, my weakness is X, but that's actually a strength because blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times people say, my weakness is I'm, I'm a perfectionist, but that's actually a strength because I can do very detailed work. Like, that's just not giving someone what they're looking for. And then the bottom three are, the, uh, I think the three that I really dislike the most, and I think a lot of recruiters and interviewers as well, is when people say, I work too much, I work too hard, I take on too much, or I'm a perfectionist. Stay away from those. Those are saying that uh, you're not humble, you're not self-aware, and you don't really um, have a grasp on maybe what your true weakness is. And those would be red flags in an interview. So definitely stay away from those. So what do you say? Is a layoff a weakness? That's an interesting question. I think that a layoff, that could be a weakness, you know, and it could be that, um, that you feel like your weakness is, is maybe a gap that you've had in your career because of a layoff. Maybe it's the confidence that you felt like you lost a little confidence as a result of a layoff. So think about like in terms of the layoff, what was the, what happened after the layoff to you to, to kind of make that a weakness? Was it a big gap? Was it a, um, the confidence level? Was it being out of the market or something for a certain amount of time? So what was the symptom, I guess, of that layoff? And, and absolutely you can use that. So Mira, I think I kind of touched on that. Like, yes, that gap in the career can definitely be a weakness. So I put together this list and I know I said, don't take anything just off the shelf, um, which of course you don't want to do that. Uh, and, and off the shelf, I mean, are typically ones that say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a perfectionist and I do this or that, but think, really think truly about yourself and give an example about where that uh, weakness comes. And these are weaknesses that are often discussed in interview settings. Um, I kind of pulled these from various different sources that I follow and talking to different people who do a lot of interviewing. So as you look down that list, I, I kind of wanted to provide this more than anything for you just to help you think through some and, and think through some ideas if you're not sure how to address it. Um, so kind of just running down those teamwork, maybe you're someone that likes to work really independently and you're not as good at maybe speaking up in the team or, or um, liking when there's a lot of talking and action in, in one spot and you prefer to be in a quieter space. Maybe time management, uh, struggling with deadlines. In that case, maybe thinking about different tools you could use. Delegating is a big one if you're at management level. Sometimes people like to hold on to their work and they have a hard time empowering their employees. Having patience, maybe in a new setting with new employees. Focus, it could be that maybe a little like me, I have a focus for only so, so long on a project then I kind of start to lose interest and I'm ready to move on to the next one. Uh, shyness, maybe you're afraid to speak up in meetings. Your organization skills, maybe that uh, your desk has stuff all over it and you kind of look disorganized, but that you know you kind of have a system and you try to change that a little bit for other people. Detail oriented, maybe in, hopefully if you're not detail oriented, you're not going to go be an actuary or someone that really needs to be detail oriented, but you know, maybe you're a marketer and your ideas are big and when it comes to the details of putting something together, maybe you struggle a little bit. Your writing skills, sometimes, uh, especially if like, and I've got foreign language down there later, sometimes if, if English or wherever you're living isn't your first language and you're needing to write or communicate in that language, using that as your weakness. Public speaking is a big one. Everyone has to do it these days, right? Get up and talk about it. That's an easy one to talk about maybe where you've struggled but have found sources to get better. Being spontaneous, uh, some people really don't like when they are called in a meeting or asked to get up and speak really quickly. They like to have everything very planned and they like to process more. Multitasking, uh, maybe you're someone that, that really likes to work on one project at a time and juggling a few things is a little harder for you. For language I mentioned, and then obviously the tech skills, and that is usually, hopefully, again, we're, we, want to, ah, doesn't want, we don't want it to be 
the number one skill they need in the job, but maybe it's a one of the skills they might be looking for and you're taking a class and getting better at it. Something that from the chat box, just to jump over to that really quick is talking about the gap and how do we highlight this or choose something like it from yours? And I'm going to get to that in just a second. And Mira, just so you know, if you haven't seen it already, there is also a webinar I did recently in the last few months anyway, on addressing a gap in your career specifically. So you might be interested in that one as well. We have a YouTube channel with, with most of the webinars that have been recorded that you can go back and look at those. This one will be there within a couple of days and you can find the gap in your career there as well. So again, that's kind of a, a big list of just, again, to, to kind of get your wheel spinning, to think about if one of those might work for you. Uh, Grant is asking, can location be a weakness? I think that is the weakness of the location, probably not your weakness. Um, maybe what, how you could put that into a little perspective is if you feel like you haven't gotten um, sophisticated enough companies to work with because of your location. Maybe you could spin a little bit that way. Uh, what is the name of the YouTube channel? Maybe, uh, Rachel, if you could, in um, the next few minutes, post the, the link to the YouTube channel. I believe it's Udacity, and then we have a careers section in there. Uh, but maybe if Rachel gets a minute, if she doesn't have a minute to do that for me, I will get it for you towards the end here. Awana, thank you very much for sharing. So the, the link is there. Thank you, Awana. And Rachel got it as well. Wonderful. Okay, so again, we're thinking about what fits me. And obviously it's gonna be a very personal decision, but hopefully this list helps you think of some common weaknesses that are out there that you could have an example for and think about how to address it. So this is a list of questions that I think helps you dig out. Again, it's that self-awareness and thinking of how you can figure out the right weakness. And, and sometimes people aren't really sure what their weakness is. And sometimes even having a peer to talk to and, and ask and, and think about it. But let's go through these questions. Is there a task I dread doing? In my case, I know it's something that I mentioned earlier that I just don't like to do. So I save it to the last minute and then I try to do it really fast. And I know that's not the best way. Uh, so sometimes when you you know it's something that you dread, it's usually something you're not real good at either. Um, and maybe you could be decent at it, but because you save it till the last minute, like that thing on your to-do list that's always uh, never scratched out, it keeps just getting on the, the next day, keeps getting pushed there. And then finally you're like, okay, I gotta get this done. That might be your weakness. And think about, is there something I really struggle with at work? Is there something that takes longer than it should? Is there something you really always have to ask for help? Think about if that's something. Um, or did your manager ever point out something that they want you to improve? Maybe it was in your performance review. Maybe it was in a conversation. Maybe it was a debrief from a project. Maybe it was a mentor on a Udacity course that, was, that pointed something out to you. But think about, has someone ever pointed, given you feedback or criticized you for working a certain way or the, your performance in a certain way? And think if there's a way you can think about it that way. Again, if I had a performance review or if you've been in a role where you've gotten a 360 survey where they ask a lot of the people around you um, to get feedback, uh, usually anonymous, so it's, it's pretty honest feedback and see if there's something you can find there. Sometimes, and even given that, if you take a, a personality assessment, if you've done Myers-Briggs or DISC or 16PF, any of the big assessments, sometimes those will help you think about what is out there that might be your weakness. Or if you haven't had a chance to do those, they can be quite expensive. Uh, there's a lot of little mini free versions online where you could do a little mini personality assessment. Not those weird ones that say like, what are you gonna look like when you're older? Anything like that. But if you look at DISC or Myers-Briggs free version, you might find something out there. I know Tony Robbins ha happens to have a, a free DISC version that it just give you, it's not as in depth, but it might give, highlight something that you hadn't thought of. Um, the last one says, was there anything problematic when I was studying or working on a project? You know, when you think about different projects you've worked on or when you've been studying something that you really struggled with. And, and sometimes a weakness 
could be something that has been a weakness for a while, but you've gotten to the point where you've really gotten better at it and you, you're building your confidence. And that's a way to talk about it as well. You don't want to end it with like, no, it's my strength because then they're going to say, well, tell me about another weakness. Um, so you might want to say like my weakness has always has recently been or over the years has always been X, but I have been working. I've been taking these classes. I've worked with a mentor and I really feel like my confidence is, is getting better and I'm noticing myself getting faster with this um, each time I do a new project. I want to ask, how do I address patients? In that case, you might think about what are some, if you're impatient with your staff or an employee with decisions being made, think about maybe what, what do you do at work to help yourself from not um, just going and yelling at everybody, right? And saying, okay, I know I'm being impatient. What can I do to make sure that I handle this right? Is it that you maybe outline a to-do list and talk to everyone and find out the status from everyone? Is it that you set deadlines a little sooner than you actually need them because you know that you're going to want it a little quicker anyway? So maybe think about some of the, the workarounds that you've done in, in your jobs and projects to help you work well with people while kind of reining in maybe some impatience. So I'm going to go through a little two-part answer strategy that I think can help you. Uh, you might have seen this before when we did a, a weakness workshop. And then I'm going to give you a few examples. First, state your weakness. Just say what it is. Quickly make it snappy. Next, explain what you're already doing or intend to do to overcome this weakness. And I've kind of walked through a few examples as I've been talking but I'm also going to show you a few here to think about how you could address certain weaknesses. So this one, I don't have a lot of experience with backend development. Then I might say, however, I have worked in front end for the last two years and worked closely with the backend developers. I've also recently completed, completed the Udacity Nano degree in full stack to expand my skills in that space. Then I might go into a little more detail, but you can see how, the weakness was that lack of experience, but you, you're overcoming that because you, you worked closely with people, so you're very familiar, and you also took a class so that you could become, refine those skills even more. As a new manager, I've noticed I'm not very comfortable delegating tasks, but I talked to an HR manager and received some tips and resources to be a better delegator. I learned to outline the task and timing and detail first so that I'm more organized, when talking to my direct reports, and this has helped me to be much more effective. So Oana asked about patience. This is kind of a way when you're talking about a soft skill where you can show you are working on that skill. Think about ways that you have resources you tapped into, things that you've done to manage that weakness. I've struggled in the past with effectively presenting my data insights. So I asked my manager, her, if manager if I could enroll in a presentation skills course. She was very supportive and I completed a two day training. It helped equip me with new skills and I'm feeling much more confident when presenting. So you can see it's still my weakness, but I'm feeling better about it. I've, I'm working on it. Again, it's that growth mindset. It's that willingness and showing you're putting in the effort and I'm aware of what my weakness is. Then you just always hope they don't say, What's another weakness? So I do always recommend to have two ready because that gets tricky when they ask for that second one. So again, ways to show you're working on this weakness or skills gap, uh, taking Udacity course. Yay, most of you are doing that. That's often the easy one to use for all of you. So good, good for you. Implementing organizational tools. Uh, maybe it's using um, Microsoft Teams or Slack or it's some type of, prioritization software, project management software that's helping you get more organized and, and overcoming a certain weakness. Maybe you found ways to tap into various subject matter experts. And the last example was an HR manager. Maybe it was someone in, maybe it's someone in backend development who you've worked closely with to try to learn more and, and take on a little bit of responsibility so you could learn more in that space. Maybe it's 
uh, taking a soft skills course like presentation skills. Um, maybe it's building a network of resources to tap into. So and this is where it's really important to think about your network of people. And people hear the word networking, we talk about it a lot, but even internally, if you're working right now, think about who you can tap into to learn something, to grow, to, to tap into their knowledge and start getting your, working your way into that space where you might want to be. I'm talking too much. We need some other questions. Okay. Uh, Mir is asking, if the answer does not convince the interviewer, something um, you just know it from their body language or asking some more lingering questions around the same point, what do you do then? Um, that's a good question. Actually, this next slide, I think it's next. Let's just check here. Yes. So quick little tips and then I'll go a little deeper into your question. Try to be concise and don't overshare your weakness. I find a lot of people, and maybe Mira, kind of like you're saying, like they don't feel like the interviewers, their body language or something, like they're not getting it or they're not hearing it. So they just go way too deep with the weakness. You know, like maybe it's, um, Oana, I'm going to pick on you because I've talked to you before and I know that you'll laugh. So let's say Oana is like super impatient and she's like, you know what, I'm just impatient. I, I throw things in my office. I get really mad when someone's late and, um, you know, I really lose my temper and, and then I'm, and then I just start going into this like deep spiral of like the worst, maybe impatient moment I had in my life. That is not going to be good, right? you you start getting nervous and oversharing and, and talk too much. So always be really concise with your weakness. And, and I, oh, and I know you don't have the personality to do that. Um, that's why I could uh, pick on you a little bit there. So state your weakness quick, avoid being defensive. Don't worry with their body language. If they're not, if you're not convincing them or if they're, if you don't know if they're getting, sometimes the interviewer is just thinking of their next question. And the last thing you want to do is say like, did this answer your question? Was that enough? Do you want me to go into more detail or you talk more about the weakness? Then you've just kind of blown it up. So with this particular question, be concise, don't overshare, definitely don't be defensive. If they say to you, well, um, did anyone ever complain about your throwing things? That seems really unprofessional. Then you'd say, well, I just threw it in my own office and you know, whatever it might turn into. Um, and this is obviously some crazy extreme example that I just came up with in my mind. It's not going to happen to any of you, but I have heard a lot of people definitely giving too much detail about their weakness. Um, and always focus more on that step too. If you need to go around a little more, if they keep linger on that point, Always think about the things you're doing to improve yourself, where you're wanting to grow and get better. Um, always look on that step two, how you're developing it, and don't dwell on the weakness itself. And if they keep asking lingering questions around the same point, maybe just, again, think of another example of how you've gotten better at that and how, you know, maybe at some point you just have to say that, that you really, you, you're very aware of this and you've made so much effort to develop it that you're really proud of yourself and feeling very confident and really bring the confidence back to you in the interview at that stage. They're giving it a hard time. All right, let's see how I did on timing. Pretty good. So I had promised plenty of Q&A time, uh, especially given this topic for one, but also the fact that I know many of you have struggled recently to book coaching sessions. So I wanted to make sure that this particular webinar was a little bit shorter in content so that we could open up and have Q&A. So at this point, I will hope someone asked the question. Feel free to unmute yourself, turn your video on, ask a question, whatever you want to do. I'm going to stop sharing my slides so that I can see maybe who's talking if you decide to turn your camera on. And remember, any questions, go. It does not have to be about this topic. Anything about career coaching. Can the slide be shared? The Yes, they will be on the YouTube channel. You will see all of the slides there. And this has all been recorded. Questions, questions. Questions about Udacity Career Services. Questions about career projects. Just no programming questions, please unless somebody else wants to answer. Hi, this is Mira here again. Hi. 
Hi, it was taking a bit of time typing, so I just decided to unmute myself. Sounds good. So I know that many of us, um, like I have a career break and that's what I'm trying to bridge. I keep studying online as well and interviewing as well. And um, we know that we, we very proudly say we are doing the Udacity course or this or that. But being from the industry on the hiring side, do you see that as an acceptable answer? Because very often I get a feel that the um, recruiters are looking for, do you have like substantial hard on the project kind of an experience? And many a times it is like, oh, uh, these are our requirements and have you exactly done these somewhere else? All we want is to change your address and come down here. So no matter how creative and how confidently we put it up, it's like, can you demonstrate which was the last project? What, 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 what was the duration of it? So there's just, how do you tackle this part when you have a gap in the career? Yeah, you know, I think, and that is always the, <clears throat> excuse me, the struggle is to, is it is convincing them. And I think really making sure, and, and it sounds like you, you know what you're, you're doing a lot of the right things. And unfortunately there are a lot of recruiters out there who, who do want every, the boxes ticked exactly how they want it ticked. And what's important is to not only pull from like, yes, the Udacity experience and any, any other projects. And that's why we say projects are always so important, but also making sure you pull from your background. What, what else? What was it? What were some of those transferable skills? And and just like for instance, I talked to someone today. Worked as a business analyst for a few years and took a break. Started taking digital marketing, and it was kind of like, okay, I can just show my digital marketing, and and that's it. I'm like, no, that business analyst, like you were, that took a lot of attention to detail and analytical work. That a lot of that transfers over. So finding ways that you can bridge some of the work you did in your past and what you've learned in the Udacity course and really showing how you can connect those dots for them to give a really nice, tight, cohesive story. And there's a new book that was, I think just came out today. It's called Either Your Turn or Your Time. And it's uh, written by, I think some of the people with, at the APRE group, A-P-R-E-S, and they help women they help men and women, but it's, I think they started mainly as helping women who had taken career breaks and they just uh, released this book. I'm excited to read it. Um, it was either your turn or your time. If you don't see it, send me a message and I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Uh, but I think that there's a lot more openness to bringing people back in after who have had career breaks. So I think that while you might get across some recruiters who aren't as open, I think also getting with companies and interviewers who appreciate what you've done during the break, whether that was a class or 10 projects or um, stayed home with your kids for half the time and then started taking classes, whatever it was, as long as you can connect those dots and help them understand your story. Okay, thank you. Just a short uh, follow up on this. So when you are, uh, the projects that you have done, let's say I have my own R and D lab and I keep working on things what kind of bucket do I put it under on the resume? Because you have like a, generally they would say client and the duration and things like that. So if I were to put the things that I do with either Udacity or I just found some data set somewhere and I work, choose to work on it, uh, how do I um, kind of bring it together on the resume without? Yeah. yeah. yeah please go ahead. Okay. This, sorry. Uh, there's a couple ways that I recommend and, and you can kind of see what you think might fit you best. One is just simply to have a project section where you talk about it. Um, sometimes when people have had a career gap and most of what they've been doing, let's just say it's been two years, most of what they've been doing over the two years is your own projects, open source, or just getting that data set or Udacity. Sometimes what they'll do in the work experience is, is put like the most current role is, it could either be full-time student or independent studies. Uh, you can kind of call it what you want. And then in there say, you know, maybe you have one sentence that says something like, um, been, you know, during this, um, during this time, something where you would say improving skills in data analysis and data science through various courses and projects. And then you can kind of bullet point those in that section. Okay. Thank you. And I'll I think both, that. both ways I think look good. So you, can um 
you know, really just play around with it and see what you like and, and maybe send it to the resume uh, career project to get review. Or if you talk to a coach or friends, you know, see what people like. Cause I think either way would work. Okay. I have a website as well where I post my stuff and I thought that people would probably be attracted and read that, but not very often people still ask you, uh, you know, yeah. traditional questions. Um, and anyway, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Hey, Angela, I had a follow up question to that. So uh, you mentioned that um, to put the projects maybe in uh, a current role section, like, for example, I was working last in May and now I'm not working, right? Uh -huh. So you're saying uh, like in the work experience section have currently, you know, pursuing yeah. the Audacity course and these are the projects there or should I have a project section? where I mentioned Audacity projects worked on and then some of the projects done previously because um, in uh, not projects, I would say uh, any big releases I did earlier, you know, but they're yeah. not exactly mapping to the degree I'm doing, you know, they right. kind of do, but, but not too much, you know, so yeah. I did get my resume reviewed by the uh, resume critic on Audacity. They told me to create they reviewed it once and they said to create a career a project section, you know, but I wasn't sure I've never done that before. Like what goes in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, can really be the nice thing about the pro having a project section is that you can really be as uh, you can be pretty creative with that. Right. And what I often tell people, the most important things on those projects is, um, always give it like a name so that when it's, it seems silly, but let's say, uh, I know one of the courses, there's like a dog breed, image classification project. You want to call that something. So let's just say you call it the dog breed classification project. That way when, when you're talking about it, it you, you can refer to it in the interview. It gives it a little identity. It gives a little more structure. Sometimes you just need one basic sentence, but you want to name it. You want to always show the technology used, like using Python, blah, 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 blah. Or if there were several technologies used, sometimes people just put in parentheses at the end, um, completed with, PyTorch, NumPy is whatever it is. And then a date. So those are the, and, and, and usually a source, like if it was a Udacity course or open source and, and kind of saying where it was from. So showing that those projects in a special project section is very good. And then, yes, I also said you can also put it in your work experience if you've taken a break. Some people even call it, you know, sabbatical leave or they call it, um, full-time student, or they call it uh, independent research, um, whatever you want to call it, whatever you were doing in that since, what was it, May, call that something. And then in there, you can talk a little bit about bullet point real quick what you've been doing and, and maybe even highlight, or you could in there maybe say, worked on multiple data science projects using blah, 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 blah. And then in the project section, you're going into a little more detail. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna um, maybe catch a couple of the questions in the chat really quick here. So I'm concerned about that career length has become a weakness in certain industries. Should we limit the number of previous jobs in our resumes and LinkedIn profiles? Um, that's a good question. And there are people out there thinking, wait, I don't have enough experience. And then there's others saying, wait, do I have too much experience? So in this case, he's asking, do I have too much experience? And then it maybe age bias comes into play. A few things that a lot of people do and a lot of people recommend now is to first delete the years off of your education. Um, so different people have different rules of, of thumb. Some people say if it's anything pre-2000, take the years off. Some people say if it's anything pre-2010. Whatever it is, if you want to take the years off your education because you feel like it seems like a long time ago, that is completely fine. And then in terms of the oldest jobs, I think it is absolutely fine to omit older jobs. If you think, you don't want to take off so many that it only looks like you worked three years either because there is a lot to be said for transferable skills and experience and life and work experience. So I wouldn't t go too extreme, but you know, I worked with someone the other day and they had two of their internships on there and they've been working for about 15 years. So I said, you know, time to get the internships off. That's fine. And also, if you do decide to keep some of the older ones, you can get less and less content so that your, your content is bigger in your more recent jobs. 
uh, let's see, there's another chat question. Let me, I'm making a career shift. I'm based in South Africa and would need to get a remote job once I'm ready to start applying. I'm happy to travel on a work visa um, if needed, but the job would mostly need to be remote. Can you tell me if it's possible to get a remote job in the AI field? Um, also, or if you, Udacity nano degrees in AI machine learning, deep learning enough to get a job in the AI field. Okay, so first, it's interesting. I just read an article today about, it was from a recruiter in AI and data science. From their perspective, they're seeing, they are definitely seeing a lot of job growth still in this area and especially growing outside of, you know, it used to be all Bay Area, uh, San Francisco and New York. And they're definitely seeing hubs opening up in a lot of different places. Most of the article was still a little bit US based, I think. Um, I read another article that definitely said Berlin is a big hot spot right now as far as Europe's concerned. So, but it talking about remote work, it said there's still very limited jobs in data science and AI that are remote at this stage, but they think that that's going to start to grow. And especially at this very senior levels, there's starting to be more remote opportunities. So I think, you know, as, as far as working remote, there's a lot of sites that we help people and guide people to if they're looking I think looking at some of those target cities that do are a little more open. I know uh, Berlin is one, Toronto is another that a lot of people when they're looking internet for an international move tend to be a little more friendly to people kind of coming in. Um, is the nano degree enough to get in the job in the AI field? I think that, you know, it really depends on any other experience you have and the type of role you can find. I know some people who have gotten, some even just entry level, more internship type roles um, after taking a machine learning course. I would say more common is that people have done several projects and then get into there. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see, we talked about career length. Okay, do human or bot recruiters do most of the resume screening these days? I think the first screening is, uh, that's a good, so I think it's a mix. I think it's a human, using a computer. <laughs> so I guess I don't think it's like totally a, a bot giving information, but I think it's a lot of humans, especially on LinkedIn, that are filtering for the people they want. And that's where so much of the keywords are important so that you don't get um, filtered out too soon in the process. So make sure you know the keywords in your particular field. If you're not sure, one of the ways you can do it is copy and paste five or six job descriptions, put them in like a Wordle where it pulls out the, the most common words they're finding um, or even just reading them and saying, okay, like this, these are the words I keep hearing over and over and over and making sure you're including those. And I think, so I think the first filter is often human, but there's, they are filtering. So they're certain using technology to, to filter their list and then kind of as it gets down to a reasonable number. I think the hard thing is, is because of it being so automated, the number of resumes is so huge that they have to use obviously some level of technology. And that's where having an in with someone, knowing anyone in the company can always help. Uh, LinkedIn just announced last week that of, they're gonna have a lot of upgrades to their job search, for the job seeker. And one of the things they talked about, it. And as far as I know, it hasn't hit yet, but hopefully it'll be coming soon, is if you apply for a job uh, through LinkedIn, it's going to pop up a message pretty quickly that says, you've applied for this job at Google and your network, you know, seven people who work for Google, would you like to ask them for a recommendation? And then you can basically click a button and say yes, and it'll go and somehow it's going to ask those people if they'll recommend you or um, so I thought it sounded pretty exciting. I don't know all the details yet. They just announced it, like I said, last week. So I think that's where having that robust network, knowing people, being connected to people can help you again. Okay, next question. Sorry, my uh, scrolling a little too quick. Okay, I'm trying to find out if the job is, I'm trying to find a job as a data analyst. Completed the data analyst nano degree and working on business data analyst but I can keep on, I keep on getting rejections. Can you help me with improving my approach? 
So it's hard to know without talking to you personally about maybe your experience or how you're interviewing. Um, if you can tell me, are you getting an automatic rejection? So is it your resume or is it first, are you getting a phone screen interview and you're not getting an interview like, and just not getting past the first screen? If you're not getting any responses, it's probably, you know, maybe we can do some things for your resume. If you haven't done the resume review project yet, I recommend doing that. Again, making sure you have a lot of the keywords, make sure you have a project section so you can show the work you've been doing. And that should help increase your chances of getting that first role. Also, if it is your first job, looking even where they're asking for interns. And if a company has very, big companies might be very specific about the interns they'll accept, what year they are in school, when they're graduating. But what I often recommend is if you see companies that do hire interns and you don't qualify based on their intern criteria, try sending a resume to someone in that company, someone in HR, and seeing if you can find an internship maybe outside of their kind of standard intern procedure. Okay, I see someone with their hand up. I... Um, I forget how to use this feature. I'm gonna hit lower hand, and then maybe then it will let you talk. Let's see. Are you there? So, is it Sampath? Okay, Sampath, maybe you accidentally raised your hand. But if you wanna talk, feel free to text it or unmute yourself. Uh, next question, I'm in the Bay Area. What are the sites one can look for jobs which are remote? Um, I'm in the Bay Area. Okay. I, I can copy and paste those sites in the chat, maybe just uh, in just a minute. Um, I'll do that before we get off. Okay. For freelancing jobs in the US, which are the best sources for analysts with predictive analytics kind of job? I used Upwork for some time. Uh, so, Upwork, Fiverr, and I think it's freelance or freelancer are ways to find those. I think from what I've heard, Fiverr is a hit or miss, and I think it's you're never going to make a living off of it. <laughs> um, Upwork, you can find opportunities. I think also, Mira, if you're looking for freelance but are open to contract work, even finding a recruitment company, that, that an IT consulting company, that you could get some contract worth work could help as well. Is it important to finish your degree before applying to jobs? Isn't it good to get some interviews experience before one takes the real plunge? Maybe apply in not so great companies and then apply to um, good ones. Yeah, I think I get mixed feelings on this. I have, um, I have a really, I think it's tough to go into an interview and give it your best shot when you really don't want the job at all. I think it's a really hard situation to put yourself in. I think if it's a job at least you're somewhat interested in, maybe that would work. Um, there's also a site called Pramp, which is peer-to-peer -peer interviewing help, and you could look into that to get a little experience. Um, I think it's absolutely fine to start applying. If you're confident in your skills, to start applying while you are Completing the nano degree is, is absolutely fine. Let's see. Okay, so Cole said back on the resume conversation we talked about earlier, his, it is the automatic rejections you're getting. So I would say definitely focus in on your resume. Look for projects, look for keywords. Remember that first filter might be happening from your resume. So, and then go through and do another Udacity career project and see if you can get some more feedback as well. I returned to school to get a graduate degree after a long work history. Would recruiters consent, consider it as a weakness not having an active work status? Oh, definitely not. I think that if you're, if you're in school full time getting a graduate degree, then I don't think that is a weakness at all. And if, if they do think it's a weakness, then you need to just convince them of everything you're learning and how you're growing and how you're gonna use that combined with your work experience to make you an even better candidate. 
What do you recommend to someone who is a seasoned professional in IT, but a little practical, but little practical experience in data science? Um, other than the courses, what are some approaches to land jobs in this area? I think that what a lot of people do that I've talked to similar to you is with getting date, getting your hands on data. Uh, there's tons of open source data where you can get your hands on free data and find, creating your own projects, looking for open source projects and really showing how you are able to combine, to use those new skills. And then again, think of ways, and I know I keep t saying this, but like think about ways like, sometimes I, like if you really think about like the job that helped you get where you are, what was it you did in that job or learned in that job to make you great at what you do now? And using those examples and pulling, extracting those highlights from that past work experience, and then showing how you can use it in data science and get your hands on data and, and see what you can do. Okay, Sampath, I have a question regarding OMSCS. I would like to talk about it next. Yes, please unmute yourself. I'm not sure I'm remembering what OMSCS. Sampath, can you go ahead and ask your question? I, I think you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay, Rachel said, um, feel free to go in this career channel or student hub. Um, I know some people are asking some private messages about how else can we get a career session. Right now, the only thing um, we, only way we can book sessions is through the portal. Um, again, we have these new coaches starting like so soon. Um, I'm not free to announce anything at this stage, but it's gonna be very, very soon. And you will see everyone's calendars um, showing much more availability. And I know that especially Brett and I, if, if you've talked to Brett before, we. We do sometimes open things last minute, um, usually not the day of, but sometimes I'll look at my calendar and something frees up. I had a cancellation of something else and I'll try to open up a few sessions. So keep checking. I, I'm sorry, I know it's a little frustrating, but we are doing the best we can. Um, and just, we do have two minutes left, so I'm gonna try to get to two more questions. See what we can do here. Um, I'm, the press, I'm in a uh, chemical engineer with 26 years of experience, I want to switch my career into data science. Joined Udacity, completed the programming in data science with Python. What is the next nano degree I should focus on to move with the data science career path? Oh, I wish I had like a really good answer. If there's someone on here that's done a lot of the data science, I would feel love for you to chime in or Rachel. Um, I'd have to talk to you more and really know. The other source I would say is to call the Udacity advisor you set up an appointment with the advisors and they are much better at answering those questions. I don't want to steer you the wrong way. Also, the other thing you could do is post that question in, if you're on Slack or in the student hub, post that question into the career section or also into your student group and, and pose that question to your mentor. And I think by getting some feedback from different people that you might get uh, a little more, a better direction than what I'm doing right now. Mark, thank you. So he says that um, the data analyst and data engineering nano degrees. So thank you. And I think from what I understand, it's maybe you figure out if which you prefer, if you prefer the more the data analyst side or the data engineering side and see if there's a specific direction you really want to go with that. And as I am finishing up here, I am pulling up the remote job boards to put in the chat group. And they will be there in just a second. And then I'm going to have to jump off because I do have a coaching call. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I really ha I loved having all the questions. It was fantastic. I hope that it helps you get 
a little bit closer to that dream job that you're all going after. And uh, I love hearing as you all land jobs and you will. Um, I know that there's so many students I hear from all the time that are getting jobs and you know, there's always a lot to have that growth mindset. There's always rejections on the way to that job. So don't get discouraged, stay positive. And right now I'm gonna post, um, there's some remote and overseas boards and some freelance boards. So I'm gonna copy and paste all of these in here for you all. And I'll keep this on for a minute so you all can copy and paste it into whatever you want, wherever you wanna save it. Did it, uh, yes, it's all there. Oops, I think it just went to Mira. Hold on, let me get it to everyone. Mira, I think you have it. Now I think everyone has it. Yes. All right, I'll give you all a minute to copy and paste that and then I'm going to have to sign off. If you have more questions, please reach out in the student hub. And Rachel, I was trying to remember our next event, but I feel like I'm <laughs> just kind of running one event at a time right now and I can't think of what's next on the schedule. So I'm sure we'll have something next week. And check us out on YouTube. I have teenagers, I tell them I'm a YouTube star, but they don't think it's funny. <laughs> I, I don't really think it's funny either, but I think it's sometimes if you have teenagers, it's funny to make them crazy.